In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So today is Shepherding Sunday, and uh, while the image of Jesus or God as a shepherd is incredibly elegant in some ways, I find it to be one of the hardest Sundays to preach, partly because it's somewhat inaccessible to me. Uh, but I do think that it's worth mentioning how much that image would have meant to somebody living in the first century. And how powerful an image it is as we sent two beloved friends off to be with their shepherd. The idea of a shepherd is someone who takes care of each one of his sheep. And in this chapter of John, we have several uh, allusions to this reference of Jesus as the good shepherd. And uh, one of the first elements of it is it ties Jesus to the rest of our story uh, that had been told for centuries and centuries. The idea of that ruddy young boy who was plucked up and chosen to be the king, to lead his people, who with nothing but a slingshot defeats Goliath and becomes the greatest of all kings. And the promise that from that stump, from the stump of Jesse, from the Davidic line, somebody would come to change the world forever. The Savior, the Messiah that everyone had been waiting for would come from the same line. So using that image of the shepherd ties those two stories together. The image of the shepherd that cares for every one of his sheep, uh, that the greatest of all people to ever live, the king of all kings, would come in the humility uh, of a shepherd, the baseness of a shepherd, that this king that is coming is not like earthly kings that take and take and take. This one that's coming will serve and protect and guide and love. The idea that the shepherd would do anything for each one of the sheep uh, is sustaining. And I imagine, uh, as Jesus told the parable, uh, people who were gathered around were, were shepherds, or they at least looked over the horizon and they saw, uh, they saw sheep and they saw shepherds tending the sheep. And the, the connection snapped into their head very quickly, much more so than it does to us. And it made it so easy to understand what happened on the cross looking back through the words that Jesus had said about being the shepherd. You see, back in those days, uh, uh, the shepherd would put all of the sheep in a pen. It was a stone pen, uh, and there'd be several different herds that were all in the same pen. Um, and it would be a stone wall that went around three and a half sides. And, um, and across the middle, the opening, uh, where the sheep would come and go, uh, that was where the shepherd slept. And they slept there because anything that would cause harm to the sheep would have to go through them. And they were willing to put their life down between their beloved sheep and anything that might cause them harm. So when Jesus says, I am the gate, I lay down my life for the sheep, he literally is creating this image of a shepherd who lies between all peril and the sheep who would give his life for the welfare of the sheep. And then Jesus goes on even farther, and he says, you know, uh, because there were different uh, herds of sheep in the, same, um, in the same pen, he says, it's pivotal that the sheep know my voice and that I know them. And I know each one of them by name. I know every single one of the sheep. I know every hair on their head. And when I call them by name, they know my voice. And they follow me. And then there's an irony that we hear in the Revelation reading uh, and in the story that the sheep follow the shepherd. But in the incarnation, the shepherd becomes the sheep. That Jesus becomes like us. That Jesus becomes like us and even becomes for us the Paschal Lamb. Uh, so the Lamb becomes the shepherd that leads us into those ever-flowing eternal waters but the shepherd also became the sheep, that God became like one of us, and then offered himself up as that paschal sacrifice for all of us. And so there is an incredible elegance in the image of the shepherd, 
Uh, but I think there's a place where it falls short for us, us who are not as familiar with sheep. We don't necessarily feel intimately and personally loved by the fact that our shepherd loves all his sheep. Even that he knows them all by name, we need the sustaining truth that we depend on is that God loves us individually, uniquely, in, in and through all of what life has to offer. So one of the great preachers, I had a, a, a really a, a, a great moment this week. Uh, one of my uh, idols in the, uh, in the faith, somebody I'd read during seminary and heard preach, uh, was our speaker for uh, our clergy conference this week. And so he's uh, up there and he's talking about uh, the, the, the art of preaching and all the things that are required. And he has this confessional moment. Uh, he's now retired and, and living on the uh, Maryland side of the Chesapeake Bay. And he says, I have fallen short in all of my 40-some years of preaching. And I am woefully inefficient in the fact that my message has always been one message. He said, I have always preached that God is love and that you are made out of love and that God loves you. And he said it was sort of like a wet, uh, not a wet blanket, but a large blanket that sort of cast over all of us. Uh, you're loved. And he said, but that doesn't penetrate people's hearts. And he said, that's what preaching has to do. It has to penetrate people's hearts. And they have to know beyond any shadow of doubt that they are loved, not that they are collectively loved. And he said, maybe it was uh, a reaction against that. You know, uh, Jesus is my personal Lord and Savior. And as long as I believe I get lifted up to heaven, uh, you know, who knows what happens to all those other people around me. Um, but he said, people need to know that they are uniquely loved. And he used this illustration and um, involves a parent and a child. Uh, since it's Mother's Day, we'll make the, uh, the parent a mother. Uh, and he says, this child was incredibly rambunctious, you know, always running under the pews, over the pews. Uh, you know, seemed to be constantly in trouble. And after probably the fifth or sixth time he'd been reprimanded that day, uh, he looked up at his mom and he said, Mom, do you love me? Do you love me? The mom pats him on the head and said, Of course, honey, I love all children. How satisfying is that? I mean, as a child, how satisfying is that to have your mom say, Yeah, I love all children. You want to know that your mom knows you knows your flaws, knows your strengths, knows what makes you tick, knows uh, how to calm you when you're, you're riled up, knows how to lift you up when you're feeling small. You want to know that you're loved particularly and that that's the kind of love that wells out that God has for all of us. When I was talking to the third grade class, uh, and we're talking about parables, and we talked about the parable of the lost sheep, uh, the, uh, the absolute ludicrous, ridiculous mad hatter of a shepherd uh, remember how they are the gate. So when they're gone, there's no gate. So the shepherd who leaves the 99 to do whatever they want uh, while well, he goes after the one uh, that loves each one so much that would leave the 99 and go after the one. And uh, we talked about how we don't know a lot of shepherds and we don't know a lot of sheep. So how could we update the parable uh, for us here at St. James? And one suggested the image of a teacher. Finding a child inconsolable on the playground, and uh, the third grader went on to say, well, so the teacher, uh, we were, everyone was supposed to go in and take a test, but the teacher uh, realized that that child needed something different, and so they spent the rest of the day uh, doing stuff for the child, uh, affirming him, playing games that he wanted to play or she wanted to play, and, uh, and spending the day doing totally not what was on the agenda, uh, but honoring that that child needed time to, to, to feel big, to feel important. Um, not quite as dramatic as the leaving the 99 for the one, but it, at least it connected to uh, something that they'd experienced as a student. Uh, what a teacher uh, who was living out of God's love might look like. And another described it as a parent. A mom who took a whole uh, slew of friends uh, to the movies, and they went to see Endgame. Uh, and then all of a sudden, right as the movie was about to reach its, um, its cliffhanger ending, or whatever kind of ending, I haven't seen the movie yet, uh, but right about at that moment where nobody wants to leave the movie theater because uh, they're going to be talking about whatever happens in the next five minutes, and um, uh, one of the children leaves uh, upset and describes how the mom ran after the child um, and missed the end of the movie and was willing to miss the end of the movie and what everybody was talking about uh, so, that, uh, so that she could console the child. Um, and that still falls short, uh, but what 
we are trying to get at is beyond human understanding, and maybe that's the beauty of it. That what we celebrate today, what brings us here today, is that there are no illustrations, no words, no examples that adequately describe the intimacy and the personal way that God loves each and every one of us. That God doesn't love us like a blanket cast over uh, all of the pews here at the church. God loves each one of us uniquely. And what a grace is that, that we follow a shepherd that knows every hair on our head, that calls us by name, that pursues us, that takes us by the hand, like Peter took Tabitha, says, Ben, get up, come with me, and takes us to the ever-flowing waters. That holds. That's a promise to me, it's a promise to you, it's a promise to you. God promises each of us that kind of love. And that spirit of adoption, that unique love, is what we'll celebrate today in baptism. That God has for each one of us what God has for Charles in that special moment of owning that unique love that our shepherd has for us. Amen.